Good evening, I'm Katie Callow Wright, Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President here at the University of Chicago. It's my distinct honor to welcome you to the David Rubenstein Forum at the University of Chicago. In addition to those of us convened in person, tonight's program is being broadcast via live stream from Friedman Hall, where we are sitting, which is, meant, which is one of many beautifully crafted spaces in the Rubenstein Forum, meant to inspire our thinking through architecture, shape and texture, nature, art, social interaction, and a sense of connection. The David Rubenstein Forum is an iconic structure on the University of Chicago campus. Its monumental form and invaluable purpose were first imagined by Robert J. Zimmer as a place to convene the power of ideas among scholars, dignitaries, and other leaders. It was conceived by the architectural firm of Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, and Charles Renfro most vividly. It was realized by the generosity of forward-thinking donors. It was built by the skilled hands of excellent construction partners, subcontractors, planners, and designers in collaboration with the university. It is adorned by contemporary artworks from the collection of Kenneth C. Griffin and historical documents from the collection of David Rubenstein. And most satisfyingly, it is now used by the University of Chicago community to advance engagement and discourse on our campus and with our partners and guests from around the world. We had expected to celebrate the opening of this building last September when it was completed. While its life as a convening hub meant to serve the entire community was sidelined by the pandemic until this summer, the facility was integral in the educational experience of our students and faculty in law, divinity, and political science throughout last year providing large high-tech spaces for courses. Although it was not built as an instructional facility, the Rubenstein Forum met the unique challenges of the time, serving our students and our priorities beautifully. Today, we're proud of the resilience of our campus community. A full student body is returning to in-person classes, faculty will again teach courses in our classrooms, and the David Rubenstein Forum is hosting convenings for which it is intended, academic conferences, strategy and board meetings, symposia, and milestone events. For so many, the forum can be a respite, a catalyst, and an inspiring place to think and share, continuing to meet the challenges and the opportunity of the time. As you saw in the video presentation, this is a remarkable space and we are deeply grateful to those who brought their vision and ideas to bear in its realization. And now we'll do what the forum was designed to do, convene the power of ideas. It's my honor to introduce today's speakers. Hannah Holborn Gray is distinguished as the 10th president of the University of Chicago, serving from 1978 to 1993, and credited with reinvigorating the university's doctoral programs and improving college admissions and student life. Recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Hannah is a member of the Renaissance Society of America, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a member of the American Philosophical Society and the National Academy of Education, among others. Don Michael Randall is renowned as one of the nation's leading musicologists. Among his many achievements as 12th president of the University of Chicago from 2000 to 2006, Don led efforts to strengthen the humanities and the arts on campus while advancing programs in physical and biomedical sciences and the university's relationship with the city and the South Side. Robert J. Zimmer served as 13th president of the University of Chicago, holding office from 2006 to 2021. His achievements in elevating the national conversation on freedom of expression and positioning the university for eminence in molecular engineering and applied sciences are well known. He currently serves as university chancellor and was named the Edwin and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Mathematics in July of 2021. Paul Elvisados assumed the role of university president just three weeks ago on September 1st. Paul previously served as the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost of the University of California, Berkeley, where he was the Samsung Distinguished Professor of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, Founding Director of the Kavli Energy Nanoscience Institute, and served as the Director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Paul's inauguration as the 14th President of the University of Chicago will take place on October 29th, and our community is deeply enthusiastic about his presidency. David M. Rubenstein is co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group. A 1973 alumnus of the law school at the University of Chicago, David is a patriotic philanthropist and serve, serves as the chairman of boards of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and the Council on Foreign Relations. He is a trustee of the National Gallery of Art, the University of Chicago, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, 
Johns Hopkins Medicine, the Institute for Advanced Study, the National Constitution Center, the Brookings Institution, and the World Economic Forum. He also happens to be a most excellent interviewer and is host to the Bloomberg series, The David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to David to moderate this evening's panel discussion. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And let me just say at the outset, and taking the privilege of the moderator, uh, I'm uh, in awe of this building. I think it's better than I deserve to have uh, my name on. Um, you know, whenever you see my name on something, you say, well, this person must be great. This building is far greater than I am. And so I want to thank the people that made it possible, in addition to the architect, uh, Charles Renfrew, who's here, here now, um, David Fithian, who served in the executive vice president of the university before Katie uh, did an extraordinary job. And I've given money to other universities for buildings. And honestly, he's the only person who actually came to me and asked my advice on things. Not that my <laughs> advice uh, was very good, but uh, he pretended it was. So um, David did an excellent job. And I really think uh, David deserves an enormous amount of credit. David is now the president of Clark University. Thanks, David, for coming. But the person who deserves the most credit, I think, is Bob. Because Bob came to my office several times, and several times I said, well, I don't really think so. And uh, you know, I think probably he came back about the fourth time, and finally I said, OK, look, I, I, I'm beginning to feel sorry for you. Uh, so yes, I will do this. But uh, <laughs> so Bob, I really want to thank you for being persistent and making certain it happened. And this is an extraordinary building. I, uh, you know, I, I just humbled by it. And I, I just, final comment, you know, when you put your name on a building, you have to say, you, know, you must have a big ego when you get your name on a building. Um, I've done this uh, here and a few other places, and the reason is I came to the University of Chicago uh, with no money. I got a scholarship here that enabled me to go to law school. And what I've tried to do in my life, among other things, is to say to people, um, you too can rise up and be part of the American dream. And so in my case, uh, when I put my name on a building, I feel that I'm saying to other people, you too can rise up, and I'm trying to inspire other people, not trying to pat myself on the back, but say to other people, you too can come from modest circumstances, rise up, and maybe have your name on a building and you know, make your parents proud. So that's why my name is on the building. I want to thank you all for uh, being here, and I would say not since uh, you know, William Rainey Harper uh, dined alone, to paraphrase uh, President Kennedy, have we had such a talent in one place at the University of Chicago. So thank you all for being here. So. Um, President Gray, uh, let me ask you, what brought you to the University of Chicago? How did you first come here? I came here as a faculty wife. OK. And what did you do as a faculty <laughs> wife? As a faculty wife, I performed a wifely duties. Okay. <laughs> but you, you had a PhD already? or I had a PhD, yes. OK, but there weren't a lot of uh, people of your gender who were serving as professors at the time at the university? There were relatively few professors who were female at the University of Chicago. A strange thing, in a way, since the university began as a co-educational institution and had women on its faculty in the first year already. And that was a very unusual thing. It also admitted women regularly to graduate school at a time when that was very unusual. But there were very few women on the faculty, no larger percentage when I came than there had been in the early years of the university. And there had not been any women trustees. I think the first women trustees were appointed in 1959. And I believe that all three of them, Kay Graham was the first, all three of them were widows of former trustees, so it was rather like the Senate in the old days. So when you became the president of the university, what did your husband say? I mean, you, you know, did you thank him for bringing you as the faculty wife for a while, or what? Well, my uh, husband was a professor who got tenure well before I did, and uh, who regarded administrators as professors do with a certain skepticism. Okay. All right. okay. So, uh, Don, uh, you're minding your own business in Cornell. Uh, 
you were provost at Cornell. Why did you um, come to the university? What prompted you to come here? Why did you want to come here? Uh, life is a pile of accidents. I don't care what you think. <clears throat> the seed of it all for me was planted uh, in Panama where I grew up and had a high school teacher who was an alumnus of the university. And I thought all through those high school years as I got to know him and my parents got to know him and his wife, I thought if I could ever grow up to be as thoughtful and intelligent and as well read as this man, it would be wonderful. So I communed with the University of Chicago in that way for very many years. <clears throat> By the time I got to be the provost, as provost, no, the headhunters start calling up. And I would, my standard answer was, why would I want to be the president of some place where I wouldn't join the faculty on a bet? <laughs> um, and so having given that answer a number of times and having turned down jobs on the faculty at Yale and Princeton, it was clear I was going to stay at Cornell forever, more fresh air intellectually at Cornell than at the places we played football against. And so we built a house, my wife and I, that was going to be the house of our golden years. We are never, ever going to leave Tompkins County, New York. And then one fine day, Ned Janata called. He was then the chairman of the board, a prince of a fellow if there ever was one. No headhunter, Ned called. And the rest is history with him. I, we made the deal on a handshake, ultimately, after going through the usual kinds of ceremonies. So was it the fact you like universities that begin with a C, or was it you like the cold weather that prompted you to come, <laughs> or both? Well, this gives new meaning to the term snowbird. Right. Uh, we go back and forth even today between Ithaca and Chicago and spend the winters here. Okay, so Bob, uh, what prompted you to come here? You got your PhD at Harvard, you were teaching at Stanford and other number of places, and you had been the provost at Brown. Why did you want to be the president of the University of Chicago? Well, first, I came to the University of Chicago for one reason, because it was one of the great mathematics departments in the country, indeed the world. And what I was focused on was how can I be a great mathematician. So that, that's what my goal was in coming to the University of Chicago. And along the way, I mean, it was a wonderful place for me doing mathematics. And as I was uh, offered positions elsewhere in mathematics, uh, well-known institutions, I turned them all down because this was always the best place for me to do mathematics. Now, say so why did I want to be president? And why when Jim Crown called me up and said, uh, want a job? Uh, uh, why did I immediately say yes? Is um, because I had been a faculty member at the University of Chicago for a long time. I understood what that meant. I was then and remain to this day extremely proud to be a faculty member of the University of Chicago because it is a place of such seriousness of purpose, such clarity of commitment to intellectual pursuit uh, both in research and in education. And it was uh, always the place for me. And it was the right place. And um, right. Okay. so here I am. So Paul, you came here earlier in your career than any of the others because you were an undergraduate at University of Chicago and one of your math professors was Bob Zimmer. So um, was he a good math professor? <laughs> He fulfilled the requirement of covering himself in chalk uh, and also of joy in his teaching. I, you know, so he would uh, come in uh, very excited and would go through a proof. And then as he was completing it, he would turn with a big smile and say, see, you know, and he was very happy. So it. It was Whether we saw or not is a debatable topic, but, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but the sentiment but, um, was, there was it that math teaching that prompted you to go into chemistry? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, what prompted me to go into chemistry was uh, actually just a, a particular event, one laboratory where um, there was a, a particular experiment that captured my imagination where uh, uh, there was a, uh, a wire was growing from atoms and uh, the faculty member who had invented that experiment was able to show us exactly the path that all the atoms had followed in order to grow that wire. Somehow that just stuck with me, and I said, wow, that's what I want to do. All right, so after you grad, go ahead. I, I want to answer the question about the president thing. Is that what you're going to ask? I was going to say yes. All right. I'll answer, ask it this okay. way. Um, Good. You're anticipating my question. I but, am. Uh, so well, you, you go to California, you, yeah. you go to Berkeley, you get your PhD there, you've lived there for 40 years, you're the provost. The weather is pretty good in California um, compared to some other places. Uh, what prompted you to want to come back after 40 years to the University of Chicago where the weather is maybe not as good as California? What, what prompted you to want to do that? Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the weather because I feel like it should be a clear demonstration of true love for me <laughs> to be here. <laughs> and indeed, it is true that um, as a um, young person here, uh, what I was exposed to led to a whole life, a whole way of having a life of purpose uh, that I was taught here. And so it's always been there uh, as a strong feeling. And so um, when I was called uh, by Joe and offered, by Joe Neubauer and offered the job, I mean, it was just such a special moment. There was no doubt in my mind that this is a place I would want to come back to because of the experience of how people think and how they uh, behave as a community has always stayed with me. It's a little bit like uh, maybe, you know, there are lots of novels written on these kinds of um, an early love which then returns very late in life. <laughs> so for those who don't know, Joe Neubauer is the extraordinary chairman of the board of the University of uh, Chicago and Joe was right here and he led the search process and that led to Paul's being selected. So uh, Hannah, you are a very distinguished uh, historian. What's the appeal of being a distinguished academic versus being a president and administrator? Why did you decide to get into academic administration as opposed to becoming a even better known historian? Well, I didn't really have the ambition to be a university president. That never occurred to me even as a possibility. But over time, as I had various academic positions, and being a kind of freak, that is, there were very few people who looked like me who were, were in our community. I served on a lot of committees, and I had a lot of sort of tiny administrative roles, you know, chairing things and so on and so forth. And I had taught at Harvard, and there I'd been the chairman of a uh, board of a program and honored his program there. And so I got put into these little positions. And I didn't really think very much about that, except that I enjoyed doing them. I found that I was reasonably good at them, that I was pretty well organized, and I loved the process of discussion. I loved the process of discussing different points of view and coming to some kind of decisions about action, some kinds of conclusions about what we might do. And then in the late 60s, actually 1969, there occurred at the university an occupation of the administration building. And that occupation of the administration building took place in the times of radical unrest at universities worldwide. And at the University of Chicago, the students, like many students elsewhere, were demand, making all kinds of demands on universities, that the universities become more relevant, that their studies become more relevant, that students have more power, that presidents and deans and provosts should go, and that elections should take place in universities in which presumably much better, smarter, thoughtful, compassionate people would take the leading roles, but, everybody, but nobody would have power. Power would be the power of everybody in the institution. And what they wanted, of course, at a time of deep distress over the war in Vietnam, and basically, of course, much of the unrest came out of that, 
was to change the universities entirely. They saw them as instruments of oppression. They saw them as instruments of, and indeed complicit in, the establishment which had led to wars of this kind, which had produced a society of a sort that required reformation and transformation. And in that desire to make the university an instrument of social purpose, so to speak, and at a time when universities were under attack, on the one hand for having students who were rebelling, and on the other hand by the students who were rebelling, I watched Edward Levy, who was a very great president of this university, and a very great person in thinking about education, higher education, and thinking about academic freedom and its issues, and thinking about the quality of intellectual engagement that should characterize this university. I watched him conduct a kind of seminar on what universities were about and what universities were for, and watched him patiently, urgently, persistently argue for the special character of universities that were under attack and made the point as to why he was not going to give in to an occupation of the administration building. And at that time, because there was an issue about a non-reappointment of a woman and it was held that the university had discriminated against this candidate because she was a woman, Edward appointed a committee and because the issue had to do with a woman, he made me the chairman of it, in order to look into the allegations that were current at that time in the student protest. And that gave me a further insight, partly because I watched closely the workings of the administration and how it was handling, and I thought it handled very well to the degree that it could, a very difficult crisis of that time. And secondly, I found that the whole process of talking to all kinds of different people in the university, we were given total freedom to explore whatever we needed to, to investigate whatever we might. I became more and more interested in how universities work and why it is that it is important for administrators to exist if those administrators understood that the administration of a university is not a form of power right. for a good administration, for a good president. It is a form of authority, moral authority above all, not an institution of power. And that the defense of universities at times of crisis like that and the enhancement of intellectual freedom and intellectual potential for everybody who was a part of that community was a kind of work of service that I found in many ways very attractive. And I would say finally, if I may, that I myself came from a family where my father had been fired from the University of Berlin as politically unreliable. That was a Nazi uh, category at the time. And so I grew up in a community of academic refugees who found, who found really safety in positions in American universities, many of them, who talked a lot about these issues, who talked a lot about what had happened in Europe, in Germany in particular, but then in Austria and much of Central Europe, about how universities had become seen as and used as political instruments, often for terrible purposes. And I heard them talk also about American universities and what they had found and appreciated in those institutions. And that too gave me a kind of incentive to want to be, if I could be, make some kind of contribution to the preservation and strength, if I could, of these really in many ways vulnerable but essential institutions. Okay. So when you stepped down as president, you were succeeded by uh, Hugo. Yes, I was. Sonnenschein. Uh, Hugo Sonnenschein passed away not too long ago, sadly. Uh, we had hoped that he would be on this panel as well, uh, but uh, that obviously cannot happen now. 
but he was a president who succeeded a legendary president, and he uh, increased the undergraduate body and worked on that, among other major things. So he was also a, a towering force in the university for quite some time. Don, you succeeded uh, Hugo. Uh, you're a famous musicologist, one of the leading ones in the world. Why would you want to abandon Beethoven and Mozart and all those people that are pretty famous to be a university administrator and the University of Chicago president? Well, I should say, as I should have said earlier, uh, the University of Chicago has had long a very powerful music department. And I had many friends and colleagues in that department, including some I'd been in graduate school with. So the attraction of being part of the music department here was uh, not inconsiderable. But I guess I've always said that if there have to be deans and provosts and presidents, I want them to have my values. And by that method, you get yourself into lots of trouble. Uh, okay. The values of this university are known, I think, to everybody. If you took a poll of the American professoriate and you ask them all to write you two sentences about the University of Chicago, they could all do it. And those pairs of sentences would be a lot of like, a lot alike. It would be about the spirit of this place, its spirit of inquiry and rambunctious debate and so forth. And Harper, our founding president, captured it as beautifully as anybody ever has, and it's beautiful and relevant to this day, that we should be one in spirit, if not necessarily in opinion. Uh, and the University of Chicago, uh, as it has presented itself to me and many others, is a one of a kind place. There's no other institution like it, uh, to which then, of course, it's very powerful in my own discipline. Okay, so Bob, you were one of the country's well-known mathematicians. What's the appeal of being a university president when people are complaining all the time, they want this, they want that, versus being a mathematician? You could have dis you know, uh, discovered Fermat's theorem or some other <laughs> great thing in mathematics. Why would you want to give up the great career you had in mathematics to be a president and president of the University of Chicago? What's the appeal of that? Well, the appeal, uh, I think, echoes uh, what we've heard from Hannah and Don. Uh, University of Chicago is a place of meaning. Uh, it has a particular point of view, has a set of values, and the opportunity to see the university advance and develop in a way that held on to, supported, and enhance those values and meaning was uh, very important to me. And I, I felt it was uh, just a great and unusual opportunity. And um, that's okay. ultimately what the appeal was. All right, so Paul, you are a world-class uh, potential Nobel Prize winning chemist. Why would you want to abandon the chemistry field uh, which is quite uh, important to the country's future, uh, to be an academic administrator, what would be the appeal of giving up uh, the chemistry profession and all the great things, you know, all the awards you've won there and all the things you could have done in the future to be an administrator, which is probably not going to win a, there's no Nobel Prize for administrators, <laughs> right? So uh, in, in my particular journey, um, I have found as a scientist, and, and, I, and I'm still a practicing scientist, and I still will be a practicing scientist here uh, as president, uh, but I, I have found in my path as a scientist uh, that one aspect of that journey is to find a sense of purpose in life. And, and the beauty of the science that I have explored means a lot to me, but what I learned at a certain point along the way was that that is not an individual journey, but it's part of a community. It's a community of people that study a certain topic, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm one member of that community. And uh, there was a certain point in my career as a scientist where uh, I was tasked with finding a way to uh, help share the advances of nanoscience and nanotechnology with others from around the world. 
And so trying to understand how to do that sharing taught me that the act of scholarship and the act of being involved as a builder of communities were one and the same. And so um, I experienced that uh, every day as a continuing scholar and scientist and as a builder of my community. And so I'm fortunate that uh, as a builder of communities, I've been offered this opportunity right. to be at the leadership level of it. So, uh, but the two roles just reinforce each other every day. They're not in, what, what, what I worry about sometimes is that they're thought of in, as in opposition to each other and that that might discourage some amazing people from being involved in roles like that. So I assume if we went back and look at your chemistry grades at the University of Chicago, they would be pretty good, right? Pretty mixed. <laughs> pretty much, oh, I thought they'd be no, perfect. Oh no, so, um, no, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I was on the path to leaving chemistry a few points along the way. There were some discouraging moments in terms of my grades. Um, well, it worked out okay. It so, worked out in the It end. worked out yeah. okay. So, yeah. all right. So, Hannah, um, let me ask you, in your presidency, what are you most proud of having achieved during your presidency, and what was the toughest single decision you had to make as president? Well, I think what I would hope, well, I think what I was proudest of was that when I came to the presidency, there had been a kind of lull in the in the life of the university because there had been the period of unrest that I described. And after that, everybody was exhausted. <laughs> and also, there were a lot of political divisions within the university that came out of those events and came out of the period of punishment of students that followed, which some people were very unhappy about and others thought was just the right thing to have done. And also then Edward left very suddenly for Washington to be a great attorney general of the United States. And so there was a vacuum of leadership and people felt that that had happened so suddenly. And somehow there was a, an absence of a kind of generation. That is, there were wonderful senior faculty who stepped up and then as wonderful citizens of the university, as well as great scholars, they were both. They, they took responsibility for seeing that things get done. And then the then provost was basically an acting president. And there was a year in which there was a presidential search that didn't pan out, and then that was postponed. And the somewhat temporary president, and also very fine senior person at the university, agreed that he, would, uh, that he would carry on for another couple of years. And so when I came, there had been a kind of lull. That is, there had been a kind of holding operation for a few years. And there were still the lingering effects of all of that and of the difficult time. There was no development function, properly speaking, left. There was no alumni function, properly speaking, left. We didn't even have a budget office. And of course, we had no money, so I don't know what the budget <laughs> was. <laughs> but uh, in any case, it was like that. And the endowment was pitiful, really pitiful. And it was a time of stagflation. The markets were doing very badly. Inflation was very high. The energy crisis had its huge effects on universities as well as other institutions, of course. And yet what I found was that the university still had the most important endowment that it could. And that was the sense of loyalty to a vision of what a university okay. could be and what the University of Chicago at its best actually okay. was. And that had to do with a life of the mind Unlike other institutions, the university was not talking about producing leaders all the time, as though you know your success was that you had X numbers of senators and X numbers of CEOs of corporations. On the contrary, the notion was that you know people might be leaders in different kinds of ways, but that our purpose had to do with teaching people to think and teaching people to think in ways that could be difficult and might be painful 
and teaching people to think in an atmosphere of the greatest possible freedom for the best possible people to do their best possible right. work. In the sense that the university was the university, that it was unlike others, that it had a special character, that that was worth cultivating and preserving, that was the endowment that was still here. And that was what you could build on. And to remind people of that, to bring a new generation into the positions of leadership in the university, those were the things that most needed doing, and those are the things that I hope I had right. some impact on. So I worked in the Carter White House that produced that high inflation when you were doing this, so I'm sorry that the inflation was a problem, but uh, you had been the acting president at Yale for a while. Yes, I was acting president, president. for Yale. So yeah. uh, University of Chicago compared to Yale, there's no comparison, right? Well, for me, Chicago was the institute, is the university. Okay. Yale is a fine university, but Chicago okay. is the place that suits me. So, Don, what are you most proud of having achieved during your tenure, and what was the toughest, <laughs> toughest decision you had to make? Um, well, when I first arrived, I thought to myself, you know, this place just needs to calm down and cheer up a little bit. <laughs> um, there was a certain amount of tension among its various component parts. Um, and so the task was, I think, more than anything, to get everybody to, in fact, remain true to that spirit uh, that Harper invoked, and to understand that we really all worked for the same institution and were interested in the betterment of that institution. So relatively quickly, actually, it turned out I was able to recruit a number of people to leading positions and to assemble a group of people who really wanted to work with one another, trusted one another, and were true to that spirit. Now, this all sounds possibly bland to you. Uh, I assure you that having overcome by that method some of the battles that were in, going on when I arrived was not trivial. But lest you think I don't have any real accomplishments. Um, you know, uh, the public relations department goes into hyperdrive when a president retires or comes and goes, you know, and one of the things that's always said, Jones took the endowment of the university from X to Y, and it was a factor of Z. Well, when I came in the year 2000, within one year, I had succeeded in reducing the size of the endowment by 20%. Hey. With some help from Silicon Valley, of course. Now, lest you think that's a fluke, I left here in 2006 and went to the Mellon Foundation. And although it took me two years there, I was able to reduce its endowment by 20% as well. Where are you going next? <laughs> I'm just hoping not to experience that with my okay. own endowment. So, uh, well, yeah, I guess private equity wouldn't have been a, your specialty, right? <laughs> so, so, Bob, uh, what would you say you're most proud of having achieved at your tenure at University of Chicago, and what was the toughest decision you had to make? Um, well, I would say that And whether this was exactly an achievement, because you say what was achieved, but I feel very good about the effort that I put into defending free expression and open discourse and intellectual challenge at this university and at other institutions. Uh, I think the, the drift that you see in the academy and that you see in cultural institutions and you see much more widely toward uh, certain groups feeling that they should have the ability to arrogate to themselves uh, decisions about who should speak and what people should hear is a very dangerous one for the academy that it's totally contrary to what a university should be and that uh, we needed to take a strong position about that, right. both for ourselves and for the academy 
in general, which of course we did. Then if I may just go a little bit further uh, before telling you what was hard, uh, I would say there were also, uh, every institution tells itself stories. Some of them are true and some aren't. And it's important to know which ones are true and which ones aren't. And there were two areas where I was happy to see um, a set of people who were willing to challenge very old assumptions. Uh, one was that we don't need to not do engineering and not only don't need to do it, but of course we don't want to do it. Um, and I think seeing the university evolve in that way so that we now have the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering and seeing it happen in such a successful and uh, scientifically powerful way is very gratifying. And the transformation of the position of the college in terms of uh, our, both our attractiveness to students, uh, what we can do for students and what we do do for students, and the financial aid support that we're able to offer them and thereby ensure that people can come to the University of Chicago independent of their family's financial situation. So these are all things that I feel, uh, feel very good about. In terms of the hardest decision, um, instead of actually pointing out one, let me just give you a category, which is that personnel decisions are always the most difficult one because they're personal and uh, they, they're, they can be very difficult for that reason. So, I, Paul, it's probably unfair to ask you what your most important accomplishments were in the last <laughs> three weeks, or your toughest decision. I, I found good places to have lunch. But, uh, so let me ask you, what do you see as the greatest opportunities ahead of the University yeah. of Chicago right yeah. now? Yeah. Um, obviously, um, you, you're just new on the job, but you're familiar with the university. What would you say are great opportunities for the university right now? Yeah, well, thank you. And um, I'd like to say that this, um, beautiful building that you've gifted, and the amazing architecture, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in some ways, to me, it uh, symbolizes the potential of what the university can be thinking about in the next period of time. Uh, we'll, um, what, what Hannah Gray just described as this uh, culture inside the university that's so intense, vibrant, successful in terms of um, really having the kinds of debates, the thinking uh, about ideas at the deepest level. That's, that's core to the university. And this forum is a wonderful place for those things to happen in. But it also looks to the city. It looks to the north, it looks to the south. And it seeks uh, by that architecture to show that the future of a great university like this is interwoven deeply with how it connects to society. Engineering is an element of that, but there are many others. And our society right now, uh, uh, our university has an opportunity for a lot of different reasons to be um, uh, playing a, a, a special role, uh, not only in our engagement with the city of Chicago writ large, but with the South Side communities, and also on topics uh, like uh, energy and climate, uh, bioscience, biotechnology, issues of free expression and democracy. So th there's a range of issues where I believe uh, a kind of engaged University of Chicago will emerge in the coming years. Uh, I hope during my presidency that that's something we will all explore together and, and create something very special. So uh, Hannah, when you get a PhD in this world, you have to have some foreign language skills and you have to defend a dissertation but you're not asked your, about your fundraising skills. But when you become a president of the university, you have to spend a lot of time fundraising. Um, did you relish fundraising? And what's the trick to getting wealthy people to give money to a university? 
Well, I think uh, my colleagues probably have other trick up their sleeves. I think fundraising is, a very small part of fundraising is sitting with you and having you say no, and then coming back to you and having you say no, and then coming back, well, I could go on. For right. Some time, <laughs> but I won't. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, a great deal of fundraising is, is, is not just fundraising, that is, presidents are advocates for their institutions and for the mission of their institutions, and indeed for the mission of higher education more generally in many ways. And so all kinds of things that you do related to the university have some impact on fundraising, right. the quality that uh, perhaps you help enhance, the way in which you go about thinking about the balance of the university between undergraduate, graduate, professional, all those things are essential for the university, but they have an impact on fundraising. And the amount of time that you actually spend coming to your office and having you say no is really the smallest part of it. And sometimes that's nice, and sometimes it's not so nice. <laughs> sometimes you have to sort of get ready for it, and at other times you think, gosh, you know, David's such a nice guy. He'll be so, uh, to see him. So did somebody ever say no to you, and then they ask you for a favor on something? Yes. What do you say then? No. Right. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so Don, uh, before we get into the University of Chicago, I want to ask you, you're one of the leading musicologists in the world. Uh, who was the greatest music genius who ever lived? Was it Beethoven, Mozart, Paul McCartney? Uh, who, was, who was the greatest in your view? Um, well, if I'm obliged to name one name from among the many people whose music I love a lot, I guess I would have to say that Mozart was as clever as any person was likely to be. But then, you know, I think Bill Evans was a sensational pianist <laughs> and a miserable human being, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, did you enjoy fundraising? Well, uh, the short answer to that is yes, because it seems to me that fundraising, um, first and foremost, is getting to know people and coming to trust them and have them trust you, and in fact, become friends. It's, I don't know, I never got any money from anybody that I didn't really think of as basically a friend. Right. Um, and uh, if you're in sales and you have the world's best product, it's not a terrible thing to do to be out there selling it. So um, Bob, you've said I've never failed to ask you this question, so I'm gonna ask you again. <laughs> Uh, when your your mother is 102 years old, does your mother still give you advice about what to do? Does she tell you to straighten your tie, or how does it work when you have a 102 year old mother and you're already a distinguished university president? Uh, no, but she does ask me, "Have I talked to my brother lately?" <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you raised a lot of money for the university. Was fundraising a chore, or you kind of got used to it and you could deal with it? Uh, I would say more than that. I actually enjoy fundraising a great deal. And the way I describe it is that, you know, sometimes people who haven't really done it, but they look at you and you say, okay, so fundraising is like begging except you're all dressed up. Right. And I think that's not the case at all. Okay. Um, which is you're only talking to somebody and somebody's only talking to you because they recognize that they have more resources than they need for themselves and their family and they want to find some way of adding to the meaning of their life. Right. And you've got a lot of stuff <laughs> which can help create meaning because uh, you, you're doing things important. So when you're connecting to somebody, you are with them in helping them in a search for meaning and how is it that they're going to, can they find some expression of meaning in a connection with the university? Now when that happens, it's a very emotional thing because finding meaning in your life or enhancing meaning of your life is, uh, okay. is, is not a small thing. 
And so you actually get to connect with people in a way that does something important for them, and you've been a right. participant in that, and you've simultaneously done something important and meaningful for the university. So I actually think it's a, it's a great thing, and I enjoy it for that reason, those reasons. Now, as the provost at Berkeley, did you have to ask people for money or the state money? I the did. state just pours money and gives lots of money to you. Oh, yeah, the state just doesn't, uh, doesn't give up pouring money into the public <laughs> university. <laughs> no, I, I was heavily involved, and, and um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can echo a little bit what Bob says and maybe say it in just a slightly different way which is it becomes an act of co-creation of uh, that individual who's giving with the president or provost on occasion, as well as with the community of the university. And, and, and increasingly what we see in philanthropy is uh, a wonderful trend, I think, where that co-creation has become uh, deeper and more creative as a result. And, and, and so it's, it's fun. So, Paul, when it was announced that you were the new president of the University of Chicago, did you hear from old girlfriends? Did you hear from your classmates <laughs> at the University of Chicago? They said they always knew you were going to be successful. What was the uh, reaction you got from uh, old friends? Oh, my golly. Uh, I got um, lots of messages uh, uh, on that day. And um, actually, one, they were um, uh, ones that mostly said, um, yeah, I could see that happening to you. Uh, so they were kind of along that category, but they were wonderful and very, uh, very warm messages. It was a wonderful day. Right. So uh, we just wrap up uh, before we take some questions from the audience. Let's put on a quick question. If you could ask William Rainey Harper any question, what would you have ever asked him? <laughs> I think I uh, would have asked him. Well, he couldn't have read the book, unfortunately. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> since you're talking about impossibilities, there was, a, there was a novel written called The Chimes about the University of Chicago, very thinly disguised, really undisguised. And that has a picture of William Rainey Harper that's totally different from the mythological William Rainey Harper that we all know, the great founder and the great visionary. In this, he's a kind of um, salesman, a kind of... Um, rather coarse and ambitious man who, who fits the, what this author described as the barbaric culture of, of Chicago, <laughs> the city, and was trying to make the university into something like the city, a place of materialism and, and corrupt ambitions and all the rest of it. And I would have asked Mr. Harper, what did he think of that characterization? Okay. So uh, what would you ask William Rainey Harper? Well, I, sp I suppose I'd ask him about fundraising and how did you get Mr. Rockefeller to do it? <laughs> oh, I have All a right. story about that. All right. What would you ask William Rainey Harper? Um, I'd ask him how the university today compares to the university he imagined and envisioned in 1890 or thereabouts. All right, and uh, what would you ask William Rainey Harper? Well, that's where I was going to go. How did he think it all turned out? You know, and what would he, um, if if he if he had the chance to look at it today, would he see it the same way? What I think I would ask him is: uh, suppose your name had just been Bill Harper, it wasn't William Rainey Harper. You didn't have three names; it was just Bill Harper. Would you have been as successful? <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Okay, let's have some questions from the uh, people here in the audience. Um, any who has any questions? Um, anybody? Somebody? Nobody? All right. Well, if there's no questions for here, I have more questions. Okay. <laughs> David, I went to his hometown, and there he was known as Billy Harper. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. He was. And there is a story about his fundraising, which, which perhaps you don't know. And that is, of course, we think about all the money he, he received from John D. Rockefeller, and John D. Rockefeller was a great founder because he said he was not going to intrude any, in any decisions made by the university, and that it was to, for the trustees and the presidents to decide what was best for the university. But 
he began to find that there were a great many deficits at the University of Chicago. And once a year, Mr. Harper went to see Mr. Rockefeller in New York in his study, and he would report on the year at the University of Chicago, and he would talk about the deficit. And Mr. Rockefeller would then go to his desk and write a check. That was the story. I used to think about that story. <laughs> <laughs> and one year, finally, Mr. Rockefeller said to Mr. Harper, I'm very proud of what you've accomplished. It's a great university, but I don't want ever again to hear about a deficit at the University of Chicago. And Mr. Harper appeared the next year in Mr. Rockefeller's study, and he said to Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rockefeller, could we pray together? <laughs> <laughs> and so the two men dropped to their knees, and Mr. Harper prayed to the good Lord about the terrible deficit. Of <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Rockefeller rose and went to his desk and wrote his last nice. check. That was the story, and I okay. would ask him, is there anything to this? Well, I... <laughs> I don't want to uh, compare myself to Mr. Rockefeller, but I would point out that he turned down the initial request for money for the university. It took him a couple of visits from people to come back to him, but, uh, and I do have a Rockefeller connection. So my family came over, our name was Rockefeller, but when they went to Ellis Island, we said, we want a nice Jewish ethnic name, so they got rid of Rockefeller, and it became Rubenstein. Okay, so um, let me ask you, uh, Don, uh, any regrets about spending uh, years at University of Chicago? And you very proud of your association? Any regrets? Would you do it or anything differently? Um, the most wonderful years of my professional life. Wouldn't trade them for anything. Okay. Uh, and that has caused us uh, a year ago to buy an apartment in Chicago in a building right. in which Hannah Gray lives. And so, as I say, new meaning to word snowbird. We spend the winter. <laughs> in Chicago and the summer in Ithaca, two of the All coldest right. places known to mankind. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, just stand up and speak loudly and uh, tell us your name. Uh, so I'm Roy Capani, and uh, I've got two daughters that uh, one graduated from the University of Chicago in Booth recently, one is a sophomore here. I'd love to hear the role that the college played, um, you know, throughout your individual tenures. I, I know that it's grown quite a bit here recently, and but um, you know, we, we know about the wonderful graduate programs here. I know the college has been evolving, but I'd love to kind of hear the role that the college was playing and the undergraduates played during your, your uh, individual uh, presidency. Right. Who wants to take that question? I couldn't hear it. Well, the question is, what was the role the uh, college played in the university when you were the president of it? What, what, what role, how did it um, affect the whole university and how did you, you know, deal with the college overall? Well, when I came back to the university, because I had been here teaching for quite a while before I went away and did some other things and then came back, it had always been my sense that the college was too small in relation to the university as a whole. Too small in the sense that students didn't feel as they should feel, undergraduate students at the center of the place, or at least equal with everybody else in the place. And too often, I think, students felt that the research and graduate and professional programs of the university somehow dominated and, and that their lives, of course, they were always very self-pitying and very <laughs> proud at the same time of the hardships that they endured. <laughs> so that when I came back to the university and gave a party for undergraduates, at the end, a girl came up to me. She said, thank you very much. That was a very nice party. And then she said, I hope you're not going to try to make this a fun school. Well, I tried to make it a little bit more of a fun school, but I had to be very careful in all of that because there was a lot of sentiment against it, just as there was a lot of sentiment for it. I did put into place a uh, process of reflection on what the size of the college ought to be, what the different components of the university should be by size and how they should balance one another. And we came to the conclusion, it was a long process, and of course it involved the faculty as a whole also. It involved the notion that, broadly speaking, without this being a prescription for any one time, we should be aiming at a third, a third, a third. And that meant increasing the size of the college, where we obviously had not just excess capacity, but a just first-rate undergraduate program differentiated from every other institution in the country, really, that ought to attract more students. 
And so while the college and, and uh, the time since I was president has, has grown a great deal more, we grew from t about 2,500, that was the size of the college when I came, to about 3,600 with huge arguments about whether every good quality of the institution was being ruined, abandoned, <laughs> forgotten, and destroyed permanently. So these arguments about size are arguments about mission, are arguments about the nature of the community and so on and so forth. But it was my thought that the college should play its central role that there should be more student activity, there should be more attention given to the quality of life. And while a great deal more has, and, and wonderful things have happened since, and, and uh, both Don and, uh, and uh, Bob can speak to all the things that they did, I made a small contribution, I think, in, in beginning all that process, and in fact, increasing the size of the college and, and having more activities that uh, we pursued. So, um, Don, um, um, do you think Robert Maynard Hutchins made a mistake in taking the university out of the Big Ten? Do you think if we were in the Big Ten and we were still playing football, we would be a better university? Um, intercollegiate athletics, especially at the level of Division I, is utterly corrupt and corrosive to the values of a place like this. Um, I think we have Division three is just right for us. We have some yeah. talented athletes, but chips are down. They know what they're here for. Hey. And I think um, on the subject of the uh, fun or not fun, you know, undergraduates have long said, Chicago, the place where fun goes to die. Um, and this made a lot of people nervous, you know, and there were people, you can't let them say that. The fact is they had so much fun saying that that you shouldn't take it away from them. Okay, all right. <laughs> and the thing about the size of the college in relation to the rest of the place, when it's not a question of which number is which, but that you should try to preserve the spirit that derived from a strong presence of research and graduate programs. Namely, every undergraduate who came here could not fail to notice that what this place was about was having original ideas. And if the undergraduate body gets to where it thinks it's the center of the universe and that graduate students are a bunch of creepy people uh, that hide out in the laboratory or the library, I think something okay. would be lost. All right, Hannah? Can I say just one thing? Sure. I know I'm talking too much, but the last All-American football player at the University of Chicago told me that he had been told by Robert Maynard Hutchins that if he had not eliminated football, the Humane Society would have had to be called in for that purpose. <laughs> final question. Uh, <laughs> Paul, uh, two final questions for you, Paul. One, uh, in this connection, uh, Coach K is the basketball coach at Duke. He's retiring this year. Are you in favor of bringing him back to coach the University of uh, Chicago basketball team? <laughs> we have Coach McCabe in the Midway Classic. Okay. How, how, how and the sec last question is, let's suppose somebody's watching this and they have a child about to apply to Harvard, Yale, Berkeley, and University of Chicago. Why should they come to the University of Chicago? Because they'll learn how to think. Okay, and the and that will just that. that will serve them in their life, and no matter what else they do, and I just think that is um, uh, such a um, gift to somebody. Uh, I, and I don't think those other universities, wonderful though they are, uh, will have that same effect on them. So um, the four individuals here have given enormous amount of their professional life to the university, and I think the university is obviously much better for their having done so. So why don't we all give them a round of applause for what they've done? Okay.
Thank you, David, for moderating an excellent discussion and for all of you as panelists um, for sharing your stories and your perspectives and experiences. So our formal program has concluded. Um, I do uh, welcome all of you to, those of you who are in the room with us, to join us just outside the door um, for uh, a, a small reception. And those of you who are joining us uh, via live stream, we hope to see you here at the Rubenstein Forum in the near future. Thank you all very much.